Good afternoon. So another exciting edition of Reading with Mr. Ali. Grenade, probably finishing it this week. Uh, this chapter is called Fire. The girl's name was Masako. She had been a student at a girls' high school in Naha before she and her classmates were conscripted as nurses for the Shikina Field Hospital. It was terrible, she told Hideki as they picked their way slowly up a muddy slope in the darkness. They were only going a few hundred yards to another command post nearby that Masako knew had nurses. They had waited until night, when it was safer. Sako had decided to come along with Hideki, because she had nowhere else to go. At first, it was just scrapes and bruises, Masako said. But as Americans pushed south, we received more and more wounded. We ran out of medicine within the first few weeks. Bandages, too. We reused those when we could. It was the nurse's job to wash the bandages out in the river, while American bombs fell all around us. The only other thing we could do was hold the wounded soldiers' hands and talk to them while they died. So that was what his sister had been doing the whole time, too, Hideki thought, if she was still alive. Any hope he had to find Kimiko at the next command post was dashed when he and Masako crept through the entrance. It had already been abandoned by the IJA. Hideki and Masako split up to search the cave for anything to eat or drink. Hideki took a narrow tunnel away from the main passage and came to a small observation room cut into the side of the hill. He stopped to look through the opening and guessed at what he could see in the distance. Shuri Castle was on fire. The whole hill was a bright red bonfire in the darkness. The castle's pillars toppled as its ancient walls collapsed in flame. Hideki was numb as he watched Shuri Castle burn. Of course it was on fire. Of course it was destroyed. He'd been a fool to think the Japanese army could defend Okinawa, and a fool to think that Shuri Castle would survive. Everything on Okinawa would burn. A divine wind might still come to save Japan, but no kamikaze was coming to save this island. Shuri Castle was gone, and Okinawa was gone with it. Hideki, look, food, Masako cried. Hideki's growling stomach won out over his heartache, and he rushed back to the main cavern. Hideki's rushed out to the main cavern. Masako had found a half-empty crate of IJA rations, food in tin cans. Hideki and Masako had to use bayonets that had been left behind to punch holes in the cans, but it was worth the effort. The tins were filled with delicious pineapple slices. Hideki gulped down two whole cans, making sure to drink every last drop of the sweet pineapple juice. He was just getting to work on his third can of pineapples, when a squad of Japanese soldiers from another command post came into the cave searching for leftover supplies. They immediately confiscated all the tin cans Hideki and Masako hadn't opened. Why are you here? the lieutenant demanded. We came here from the field hospital, Hideki said. The Americans attacked and drove us out. The lieutenant nodded. Well, it's time for you to both to rejoin the army. Come with us. No, not again, Hideki thought. He just wanted to find his sister, not get pulled back into the war. He looked around for some place to run, to hide, but one of the soldiers was already grabbing him, and Masako by the arms and dragging them to their feet. This is your island, after all, not ours, the lieutenant said. You should be the ones fighting for it. What island, Hideki thought. What was there left to fight for? And who should, who should he be fighting? Hideki hated the Americans for attacking it and the Japanese for giving them a reason to attack. The Japanese soldiers dragged Hideki and Masako to another cave. It wasn't far away, but it hadn't yet been discovered by the Americans. This bunker was crammed full of Japanese soldiers, both healthy and wounded, and eight Okinawan children who had taken refuge with them. Hideki and Masako were quickly forgotten, and the food they had found was taken away and given to other soldiers. Hideki fumed, but didn't say anything. He knew better than to argue. Got to find a way out of here, Hideki told Masako. Why? she asked. Isn't it safer with the soldiers? Wasn't very safe in the field hospital, was it? Hideki pointed out. No, you idiot. It wasn't Masako who had spoken. It was another girl nearby, a nurse scolding one of the children. Hideki couldn't see who the girl was, but there was something about the way she said the word idiot. Something in the scolding yet compassionate tone that made his heart skip a beat. His eyes went wide. Could it be? Hideki broke away from Masako and flew across the room. Two Japanese soldiers barked at him for squeezing between them, and he almost fell, pushing his way through a knot of arguing children. But at last, he found her. The nurse had her back to him, tending to a young boy's scraped knee, and Hideki grabbed her by the shoulder and spun her around. It was Kamiko. Next chapter, The Girl Who Died. Hideki? Kamiko gasped, her eyes growing huge. Kamiko! Hideki cried. He couldn't believe his good fortune. His sister was alive, and he'd found her. After all he'd been through, and after all he'd done, and all he'd lost, 
Finding Kimiko felt like the sun emerging after weeks of rain, and he basked in its warmth. Hideki hugged his sister tight. After a long minute, Kimiko held Hideki at arm's length and gazed at him, like they hadn't seen each other in years. Hideki wondered what he must look like. Stick thin, barefoot, hair a, hair a wet, tangled mess, wearing an oversized Japanese uniform. Did he look years older the way Yoshio had? Kimiko definitely looked older, more adult. Her round face had lengthened, and her full cheeks had flattened. She looked weary and wary, like she had seen too much to be shocked by anything anymore. Wiser, too. Kimiko wore her, wore her nurse's uniform, a gray western-style pleated dress with short sleeves and a wide white sailor collar. Pouches for bandages and medicine hung from a wide black fabric belt worn high above her waist, and a white nurse's hat covered most of her black hair. Just a hint of the white streak still showed. Kimiko looked as happy to see Hideki as he felt, but then her face fell and she smacked him hard on the head. You idiot, Kimiko told him. You got here just in time to die with the rest of us. Ow, don't. I hurt my head, Hideki cried. Kimiko felt gently in his hair for the wound and found the stitches. What did you do? she asked. What do you mean, die with the rest of you? Hideki asked, deliberately ignoring her question. The Japanese soldiers here are going to attack the Americans tomorrow morning, and we're the first wave, Kimiko told him. They're going to use the Okinawan children as human shields. Hideki's heart cracked into pieces and fell apart. He sat down on an empty munition box and start, stared at the boys and girls at the back of the cave. They were all much younger than him, around five to ten years old. They couldn't know what was coming and couldn't do anything about it if they did. To think about these little boys and girls, after all they had already lost, being thrown to the American guns, Hideki closed his eyes and cried without tears. What are you even doing here? Kimiko asked him. I came to rescue you, Hideki told her. Rescue me? I was about to rescue myself. But now I have to rescue my little brother, too. You don't have to rescue me, Hideki protested. I'm rescuing you. Kimiko's expression shifted from exasperated to suspicious. She squinted and looked him up and down. What? Hideki said. Kimiko didn't say anything, but it was clear to Hideki that she could see there was something different about him. Could Kimiko see Ray's Maboy on him without Hideki even telling her about it? There's something else he needed to tell her first. Kimiko, Otto is dead. So are Anma and Isumu. Kimiko put a hand to the wall of the cave to steady herself. I knew that Anma and Isumu were gone. I heard their ship had been sunk, but Otto... I sensed he had gone to join our ancestors, but I didn't know for sure. Tears spilled from her eyes. You and I are all that's left now. That's why I came for you, Hideki told her. I was with Otto when he died. I promised him I would find you, and I did. Miko laid a hand on his shoulder, and Hideki covered his sister's hands with his own. I never told her parents what really happened to me, how I got the white streak in my hair, Miko said. I never told anybody. Hideki frowned. He couldn't remember a time when she didn't have the white streak. It was years ago, when you were just a baby. I was too little to go in the ocean without Otto or Anma there, but I did it anyway. Me and Fumiko, another girl from the village, a giant wave and cumble, tumbled over me, sweeping me under and flipping me over and over so I didn't know which way was up. I'd never felt so helpless, so out of control. I couldn't breathe, couldn't scream. I hit my head on a rock and passed out, and the next thing I knew I was flat on my back on the sand, and Fumiko was bent over me sobbing. She told me I wasn't breathing when she pulled me out of the water. I had drowned. I was dead, and now I was alive again. Hideki was aghast. How had he never heard this story before? I never told Otto and Anma what happened, because I didn't want to get into trouble. But when my hair grew back in the place where I'd cut myself, it grew in white. And from that day on, I had a special connection with the dead. That's why I'm a Utah. Her voice grew soft. I've been dead once, Hideki. I don't want to die again. We've got to get out of here, said Hideki. Is there another way out of the cave? Yes, Kimiko told him, but you're not going to like it. Last chapter for the day. The mother of all bombs. Kimiko was right. Hideki didn't like it. An unexploded bomb the size of a cow sat in the mud right in the mouth of the cave's back entrance. The bomb was greenish gray with four black fins sticking up at the back and a yellow band painted around the base of its nose cone. Why the huge bomb hadn't gone off when it hit was a mystery and the slightest touch now might set it off. If it exploded, the whole cave would be blown to bits. It was the mother of all bombs, and there was barely room to squeeze past it. The IJA hadn't even bothered to leave a guard by this back exit, because they thought no one would be crazy enough to go near the bomb. Hideki took a step back in fear. That's the only way out? he asked. Yes, Kimiko told him. 
It's either that, or you die tomorrow with those soldiers. I overheard the generals at the command post. The plan is for the IJA to hold out as long as they can at the ridge. Just when the Americans are about to overrun them, they retreat to the next ridge and start all over again, all the way to the southern end of the island. In between retreats, they send infiltration squads to attack the Americans by night. But they're not meant to survive either. The Japanese army was never going to win, Hideki. They're just here to slow the Americans down. They're trying to take as many American soldiers with them as they can, and as many Okinawans too, I guess. Hideki felt numb. One plane for one battleship. One man for ten of the enemy. Wasn't that what Lieutenant Colonel Sano had told the Blood and Iron Student Corps before sending them out with grenades to attack the Americans? That night outside his school felt like years ago to Hideki. But the price of an Okinawan life was far cheaper even than one man for ten of the enemy. Far cheaper than the life of one Japanese soldier, that was for sure. And Hideki was tired of sacrificing people he cared about. Then we do it, Hideki said. The mob might go off, and it might not. But if we stay, the IJA will definitely kill us. And at least this way, we have a chance. Kimiko looked sideways at Hideki like she was measuring him again, but she didn't say anything. Hideki and Kimiko went back to the main part of the cave. They told Masako the plan, and very quietly, the three of them gathered the eight Okinawan children and led them to the back entrance. Masako gasped when she saw the bomb. We have to get past that? You can do it. We have to, Hideki said. He turned to his sister. You and Masako go out first. I'll send the kids out to you. Get them as far away from the bomb as you can. Kimiko nodded. She approached the bomb, took a deep breath, and slid sideways between the cave wall and the metal shell. The space was too narrow to avoid touching the bomb. And gently, oh so gently, she put her hands against it. Hideki held his breath, and Masako closed her eyes. Kimiko wiggled sideways, and the gap between the bomb and the wall got tighter. Tighter. She spread her arms around the bomb and carefully rested her weight against it as she slithered through the narrow spot. And then she was past it and outside. Hideki let out his breath, and beside him, Masako opened her eyes and bit off a sob of relief. You're next, Hideki told her. I can't do it, she said. You can, Hideki told her. We survived that cave of flames, didn't we? These kids need you to be just as strong as you were for those injured soldiers in the hospital. I know you can do it. Just do what Kimiko did. Masako took a deep breath and nodded. She avoided the bomb as long as she could, pressing herself against the cave wall. But soon the space grew too narrow, too short. She froze, her back curled against the cave wall, holding her body just centimeters from the curving side of the bomb. Kimiko called encouragement to her from where she stood outside, but Masako couldn't go any farther. She closed her eyes and shook her head. Her trembling body hovered just inches above the bomb. Masako, you can do it, Hideki told her again. No, no, I've seen what American bombs do to ba bodies. I don't want to end up like that, Masako cried. You won't, Hideki said. He looked at the frightened children with him. None of us will. Masako just shook her head more forcefully. She wasn't going to budge. But she couldn't keep pressing herself into the curving wall at her back forever. With a scream of panic, she lost her balance. With nothing to grab onto, she fell face first onto the bomb. Hideki gasped and closed his eyes, waiting for the mother of all bombs to explode. So we'll stop there. I'll keep on reading tomorrow. So have a great rest of the day. Keep taking care of each other. And remember, range the blank.